so uh, the topic of this talk actually is based on my dissertation project, uh, which was uh, a study on looking at the habitat preference for the northern emerald dragonfly, which is a very elusive and rare dragonfly species uh, confined only to Scotland within the UK, uh, as I'm sure most of you are aware of this. Uh, and in fact, we can look at this right away by looking at this map here uh, that shows the distribution of the Northern Emerald Dragonfly in Scotland. Uh, we can see that not only it is limited only to Scotland, but it is realistically limited only to the center and northwest of Scotland. Uh, and it's not really found anywhere else. So it has a very, very limited distribution in the UK. Uh, it is listed uh, as near threatened in the UK. Uh, now, this is on the British Odonata red list, no on the IUCN red list. Uh, I am, I believe there are current efforts being put in place to increase its status to uh, endangered, but as far as I'm aware, these have not been successful yet. Uh, so what, what are the current known habitat preferences? Well, based on current, so, current observations, uh, we know that this dragonfly seems to prefer sphagnum filled bogs. So we are really looking at uh, peatland environments here. Uh, spe specifically, it seems to prefer sphagnum filled bogs in the vicinity of coniferous woodlands, although some of them have been found also near broadleaf or mixed woodlands. So this is indeed more of a preference rather than a requirement. Uh, there seems to be also preference for shallow bog pools. Um, we're talking uh, in the range of 25 to 50 centimeters of water depth on average. Uh, but once again, even in the study, we found them in pools that were much deeper than that. So this seems to be a preference. Uh, there is some evidence from studies outside of the UK of uh, a specific preference for certain elevation ranges. Uh, however, these were uh, seen in the Carpathian Mountains in Eastern Europe and on the Alps, and uh, it's unlikely to have the same effect here in the UK because we just do not have the same elevation ranges. So the distribution here, it's more likely to follow a latitudinal gradient for north and south rather than an elevation range. Uh, one of the main issues and uh, surrounding northern emeralds and why it is important to study northern emeralds is that we have actually very, very limited literature. Uh, many on, of the studies, many of the papers, especially peer-reviewed papers that we have are very dated and uh, potentially uh, have outdated information in them. Uh, this problem is even greater in the UK because we have even uh, less literature about its distribution in the UK. Uh, many of it is actually uh, comes from the species reviews from the British, British Dragonfly Society itself. So there is clearly, clearly a great need to study the species more in, great, in greater details. Uh, another issue and uh, why we need to study the species is its distribution, which is actually quite confusing if you think about it. So. If we look at these little areas on the map, these orange areas, these are actually areas of potentially suitable peatland. However, by looking at it, only a very small section of them is uh, displays any presence of Somatochlora artica, so of northern emeralds. Uh, so why is that? Well, we don't know exactly. And uh, it's, it's clear, very likely, that there is going to be a multitude of other habitat preferences that impact on it, on the distribution of the species. And uh, some of them we are somewhat aware of, like I mentioned before, uh, woodland presence, for example, but they have not been quantified yet. And uh, knowing this could really help us to understand uh, the distribution of the species. So our aims for the study, they were to assess the distribution of the northern emeralds in Scotland, quantify and really understand the habitat preference for the preferences for northern emeralds, and potentially with the data that we collected inform future peatland and dragonfly conservation programs. So our study took place in uh, three different sites. These were Benay uh, Nature Reserve, Abernethy and Log Garden Nature Reserve, and Flanders Moss Nature Reserves. Uh, the first two sites, Benay and Abernethy, uh, they were more northern sites, and they are generally considered to be um, somewhat of stronghold sites for the species, so where the species is found in greater abundance. Uh, Flanders moss, in, con in contrast, is found at uh, somewhat of the southern edge of the habitat range of the species, and uh, the species is still present there, but it's not present in the same uh, amounts as the other two sites. 
Uh, the sites are also very, very drastically different from one another, which is good for this for the study because we really wanted to look at how different and varying habitats uh, would impact on the presence of this dragonfly. So Flanders moss, for example, is very bare with very little presence of trees on the site. Uh, there is there are woodlands surrounding the sites, however. Uh, Abernethy is instead is a site that is covered in vast area of coniferous woodlands and uh, it, that is intertwined with uh, great areas of peatlands. Uh, Benet is very varied. Uh, there are uh, coniferous sites, there are there are peatland sites, there are mixed woodlands, there are broadleaf, broadleaf woodland, there are peatland sites that are found at sea level and peatland sites that are found at greater altitudes. So once again, these are very, very different sites. Uh, the surveys were carried out last summer, throughout the summer months, and uh, both adult and uh, larvae survey were carried out. However, the greatest focus was on larvae because the adult surveys were impacted by uh, adverse weather conditions. So the methodology that we utilize for the larval survey uh, was first of all regarding site selection to utilize a 20 by 20 meter quadra area uh, to that would include as many bog pools as possible. So we really try to maximize the number of bog pools within each one of this area. And then we would replicate these areas multiple times per each location. And then of course, in the other locations, uh, we utilize this method as opposed to selecting each individual pools because we really hoped to have a standardized and quantified amount for each uh, for each replicate, but at the same time we were hoping that by using this method we would limit as much as possible any possible bias coming from uh, selecting each individual uh, bog pools. Uh, for the adult surveys, instead we utilize very classic transect surveys. Uh, these are this is a very standardized method for surveying adult dragonflies. So we would just lay down our transects and uh, walk along the transects and uh, record the numbers and species found. For once again, moving back to the larvae, uh, these were collected from the bog pools by using either a calendar or a kick net, depending on the water depth and sphagnum density, to dislodge them from underneath the top sphagnum layer. We can actually see it, see it in this photo right here. And uh, these would then be put into a, um, a white container. I don't know if you can actually see it. Oh, sorry, wait, it's red. Uh, and in the white container, they would be uh, counted, they would be identified, and uh, then they would be released, of course, safely back into the bog pools where they were originally collected from. Uh, we can see actually some photos here of the uh, field work surveys that we were doing. Uh, top left and bottom right, these were actually taken at uh, Benet uh, doing a larvae survey. Uh, here it's me uh, on the bottom left. Uh, this is, was at Abernathian Log Garden. And this right here as a larva of uh, Northern Emerald. Uh, so we of course collected lots of environmental data as well, as you can imagine, if, since we really wanted to understand the uh, habitat preference of the species. So this range from water pH, temperature, water conductivity, water depth, sphagnum species, sphagnum covers, sphagnum depth, uh, uh, nearest woodland type, uh, uh, distance in between the, each individual box and uh, the nearest woodland and of course site elevation. Uh, moving on to our results. So first of all, by looking at this table, the first thing that jumps to our eyes is the numbers, the difference in the numbers of Northern Emeralds is this one here, Somatocolor Arctica found for the two, at the two sites uh, at Abernethy and Benet compared to Flanders Moss. So we can see that throughout last summer, we found 16 individuals or Northern Emeralds at Benet and 14 individuals uh, at Abernethy, but only two at Flanders Moss. So this is actually quite a drastic difference that shows how the species seems to be much more abundant in the Northwest compared to central sites. Uh, another interesting thing that, that can be seen right away is the difference, the, massive, the drastic really difference in numbers compared to more common odonate species. So for example, here uh, at Abernethy throughout the summer, we found only 14 individuals of Northern Emeralds, but at the same time, we found 165 individuals of large red dancer flies, 56 individuals of first spotter chasers, and 45 individuals of common hawkers, all very common odonate species. Species. So once again, this really shows how rare this dragonfly can really be and why it is important to study it. 
Uh, this is a very, very uh, interesting graph here. Uh, this is a very interesting plot. Uh, this is a, larval, a peak larval activity plot for each survey location, and it shows the month during the survey period in which we found the highest number of larvae for each location. Uh, sadly, this is kind of a, irrelevant for Flanders moss because we, on, we only found two individuals. So the sample size is definitely too small to draw any clear patterns. But it shows really interesting patterns and contrasting ones uh, that uh, for the sites at Abernethy and Benet. Uh, for example, here at Abernethy, we can see this, this peak of activity in June and then a drastic decrease in July. Uh, this contrast with Benet, where we see a very constant period of activity in May and June, and then a, a peak in July, which is opposite to what we see at Abernethy. Uh, this actually has implication for climate change and the droughts. Uh, and I'm gonna go back to this later on because this is actually very important and interesting. So moving on to the actual habitat preferences that we found, uh, uh, in our study, we found that four of the variables that we selected had an impact on uh, uh, dragonfly, on northern emeralds presence. These were the distance to the nearest woodland, the woodland type, the sphagnum cover, and the sphagnum species. Uh, here, for example, in uh, scatter plot A, we can see uh, that there is much more concentration and, and presence of northern emeralds uh, in sites that are basically adjacent to woodland. Uh, and this presence goes drastically down. This is, this is basically zero. This is almost nothing for sites that are far away from woodlands. Uh, likewise here, we can see in this plot, in plot B, that uh, we have a somewhat of a similar pattern uh, regarding sphagnum cover. We can see that there is a much higher concentration of nor northern emeralds found uh, in sites that have very high sphagnum density uh, with a overall coverage of the bog pools in between 80 and 100%. And this presence goes drastically down uh, if for sites that uh, have much more presence of open water. So once again, this is very clear patterns here that can be seen. Uh, we can see the same one here in box plot A, we can see that there seems to be a very clear uh, preference for Northern Emeralds to be found in conifer near coniferous sites uh, and somewhat actually mixed sites as well, but very little presence found in broadleaf sites. Uh, here actually in box plot B, this was actually very, very interesting because this was a, a new correlation that was never observed before as far as I'm aware. And uh, we observed it in our study, and uh, uh, we found that uh, northern emeralds seem to be found more likely uh, in pools filled with either sphagnum cuspidatum or sphagnum nuticulatum. So, uh, compared to other species of sphagnum. So, this again, this was something quite new that we were not expecting, and it was quite, a, quite an interesting observation. And this is actually interesting in contrast with pools uh, filled with sphagnum sphalax. Uh, here we actually found no individuals of northern emeralds whatsoever. Uh, this was all zero. Uh, we didn't. We never found a northern emeralds in a pool filled primarily with sphagnum phallax. So this is, was a very very interesting new observation. So what does this mean for actually uh, northern emeralds? What are the implications here? Uh, first of all, we have statistically tested data now that conforms with previous observations. This is specifically regarding the importance of woodland. Uh, this observation can actually explain those patterns that we have seen before regarding distribution, those confusing patterns, because now we can start thinking a bit more uh, at uh, its habitat range and we can think, okay, they don't just require peatlands, of course, they just, they require, they have more strict habitat requirements, they require specific vicinity to woodland sites, they require specific coverage of sphagnum layer and perhaps even specific sphagnum species. So it, their distribution actually makes more, makes more sense, uh, the fact that it's already Reduced. Uh, we found no clear evidence of an impact from elevation. Uh, this was actually as expected. As I mentioned before, it's more likely that the distribution in the UK follows the latitudinal gradient. Uh, so once again, we found that uh, this new correlation with uh, certain sphagnum species. Now, this is actually really, really exciting and uh, a new thing that was found. Uh, it could also help to explain the distribution of northern emeralds in the UK because, for example, certain sphagnum species could be found only in certain areas of the UK, and therefore they could be potentially suitable 
uh, peatland sites that are that have perhaps bogs that are very close to coniferous woodlands and seem perfectly suitable for the species, but actually are covered in uh, sphagnum species that are uh, really not preferred by northern emeralds, and therefore the sites are actually not suitable. So this could really help to explain its distribution uh, even more so once again. Uh, however, as far as I'm aware, this was the first time that this correlation was observed, so much more research is needed before we reach any clear conclusions on this. Uh, sadly, we didn't find any evidence of an impact from any of the variables relating to water quality on northern emeralds. I am saying sadly because had we found any evidence of this, we could have made an argument that northern emeralds could have been used as a by indicator of water quality, which could have had some positive implication for its conservation. Uh, and I'm actually going to go back on this in a minute. Uh, however, it's also important to mention here that we looked at a very, very limited amount of variables relating to water quality, and there's still lots more water turbidity, eutrophication, total dissolved solids that needs to be looked at. So once again, this is another area for further development. Uh, implication for the conservation of the Northern Emerald itself. So with the data that we have, especially regarding the importance of woodland, we can really inform conservation programs here. And they could start uh, by, for example, uh, focusing on helping Northern Emeralds by expanding or maintaining areas of coniferous woodlands near peatland sites that already have presence of Northern Emeralds. Uh, another potential technique to be used is the use of woodland corridors to accommodate the habitat fragmentation. However, doing so would require to have a presence of woodlands within the boundaries of peatland and that could really lead to very negative impacts on peatland management so it, it is really not as recommended uh, as i mentioned just before uh northern emeralds could have have there could be good implication for using northern emeralds as a bioindicator but why is that the case well uh if Northern Emeralds could be used as a bioindicator, that would make Northern Emeralds a very useful tool to determine specific uh, water quality and water characteristics. Uh, doing so would make Northern Emeralds a good asset. And uh, in doing so, there would be more incentive to, uh, for example, spend more research on Northern Emeralds and to have more fundings uh, to going towards the conservation of northern emeralds. So indeed, being a mandicator, it would be it would have, could have very good implications for the conservation of northern emeralds. Uh, northern emeralds that does display some signs of being a good bioindicator, for example, by having uh, uh, very strict habitat requirements. However, the fact that we didn't find any correlation between between any variables relating to water quality and the presence of Northern Emeralds for the moment disqualifies Northern Emeralds from being a bioindicator. Uh, but this could change in the future, you know, if any new correlation is found, as I mentioned before. So there are, of course, some impacts from climate change on Northern Emeralds, sadly. Uh, some of these can be seen by looking at the numbers of Northern Emeralds found in Northern sites compared to the ones found in more Southern sites. Uh, the fact that Northern Emerald is, seems to be much more abundant in the North, for example, is somewhat consistent with the patterns seen with other ordinates in, of northward, north, northward shifts in their distribution. So they basically, uh, the distribution of species seems to be moving towards North. And this is again, a very, very common pattern, not only with ordinates, but with many other invertebrates all around the world, not just in Scotland. Uh, these are also somewhat similar to patterns seen uh, with elevation shifts uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, there are also uh, potential impacts from droughts that we have observed, and we actually go all the way back here to this plot. Uh, if we, if you remember this decrease in uh, activity seen in July in uh, Abernethy, uh, this actually coincided with the heat wave event that uh, really hit Scotland, the, the older UK really last year, and caused extensive droughts all around. Um, so I can actually confirm you that when we arrived at Abernethy at uh, the end of July last year, we found a very, very large amount of uh, the bog pools that would be otherwise perfectly suitable for Northern Emeralds to be completely dried out, uh, which of course really affected, first of all, our ability to conduct the surveys, but also the number of dragonflies that we could find. Uh, so this really seemed to have impacted the presence of Northern Emeralds in that month. Uh, contrast this with Benay, this is an area much more uh, notorious for being prone to 
precipitations and was not nearly as affected by the same heat wave event and therefore actually recorded a period of peak activity uh, on during the heat wave event uh, the completely con contrast with what we've seen in Abernethy. So actually, uh, had the heat wave not happened during the month of July, perhaps we would have seen a period of even greater peak activity at Abernethy during the month of July. So yes, there, there's clearly signs of an impact from uh, uh, droughts and climate change on the species. A uh, quick word on future research and a summary uh, before uh, we're done. Uh, as I mentioned before, future research really is required to understand how water quality impacts on the presence of northern emeralds and potentially to classify northern emerald as a bioindicator. Uh, further work is required to also uh, determine uh, the validity and, and to really find uh, more about this correlation uh, that we found in our study regarding the impact from sphagnum species on the presence of northern emeralds. And finally, one of the most important things is that lots of work needs to be carried out to determine the viability of different conservation and mitigation techniques, such as the expansion of existing woodland areas around peatland for and see basically how these benefit uh, existing population of northern emeralds. So just before I finish, I would like to give a, a special acknowledgement and thanks to, first of all, the British Dragonfly Society for both helping funding partially this study and uh, in general for hosting this event. Uh, also, I would like to thank some very special people that helped to, uh, throughout this uh, study and the surveys. This is Dr. Alan Law, uh, my project service supervisor, both Pat and Danielle, who are here with us today for training and consultation in odonate identification. Uh, Stephen Longster, the help with uh, sphagnum identification. Uh, Doug Bartholomew, Richard Mason, and Amy Hood, who were the reserve managers for uh, Benet, um, Abernethy, and Flanders Moss. And finally, George Winter, who was a fellow student who helped with some of the surveys. And of course, thank you very much to all of you for listening. <laughs>